Welcome to Emotional Resilience, Living with the Fruit of the Spirit. I'm your host and author, Ron Ovett. This is session two, internal, continuous, unavoidable stress and how it plays havoc on our emotions. You know, I'm so glad that you're back here for lesson two. Now, perhaps you're watching for the first time. If so, you can go back and watch lesson one, get the notes on it, and I encourage you to uh, stick with this program. Uh, you know, if you don't have the notes, you can contact me at ron at empowerministry.org. That's ron at empowerministry.org, and I'll be happy to send them to you. Well, in this lesson, we want to start talking about the fact that there's this stress that continuously goes on. It's, it's part of that inner thinking that goes on, our inner reality uh, that we'll talk about later in Lesson 7. Uh, but there's this inner reality that can cause stress, and we'll explain that as we go along. You see, emotional resilience is based on three things. Now, I came up with this years ago when we were uh, working in this class, and we decided that, you know, first of all, there's emotional recognition. We need to be able to slow it down, recognize. We want to become such a good detective that we can tell when we're starting to get emotional. Now, part of the way you'll do that is to recall an emotional episode and then reflect upon it. And that's why I encourage you to even now start keeping a little emotional journal. You know, reflect upon a day. Did I have an emotional episode? Uh, what was it like? Uh, what was the circumstance? What caused it? What was I believing about myself or the situation? Uh, what was I fearing or angry about or whatever the emotion was? What was the emotion? Uh, those are the kind of things that are going to serve you well. As we learn to recognize them, then we'll be able to regulate it. We'll be able to bring it down. And we talk about the hand model of the brain. And if you will, the prefrontal cortex is that rational part of the brain. And inside is the limbic, the emotional part, which has the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thymus, a bunch of different parts. But for our sake here, we're talking about the amygdala and the hippocampus. Then there's the brain stem that reacts with that whole central nervous system. And, and so when we learn to breathe, we learn to relax, we learn to what? As we flip our lid, we learn to what? Bring it back. <laughs> Bring it back and to get that rational part of the brain online where we can then uh, calm ourselves down and start to, you know, act normal again and not in that emotional state. Eventually what we want to do is the third part of this program and that is emotionally relearn. And I use the example a lot of times of, of someone that uh, feels that they're ugly. You know, it could be a man that's handsome or a woman that's beautiful. And, and they feel they're ugly. Try changing their mind. <laughs> Have them write on the board a hundred times, I'm beautiful or I'm good enough. <laughs> it won't work. They somehow emotionally learn that. Perhaps it's when they were young and mom's combing their hair and saying, you know, you're not going to have any boyfriend with hair like this. Or in my case, I had two colics. Now, uh, obviously, I took care of that situation, right? But I had two colics. And <clears throat> I remember my mom telling me how, you know, she couldn't get it to lay down in the hair and this. And even though she didn't mean anything by that as a young child, I picked up that there was something wrong, right? And we get a lot of these body images and things about ourselves that go uncorrected and they get amplified in a child's mind. And, and so it becomes an emotional learning. Uh, much like a, a child that goes to the beach and, and, and dad's there, don't go near the water, stay back. Well, they're looking over here and the sun gets closer because the siblings are playing and all of a sudden a wave comes, knocks them over, gets water in their lungs and <clears throat> is coughing and mom's there, oh no, you know, dad's running there. I told you not to go and the kids are all, you know, they're making a big fuss and the kids, you know, <clears throat> you know, and all this and, and, and they hear about it, you know, the rest of the day on the way home. Next year when they're planning a trip, they hear, he hears about it again. Well, that, all that makes this impact in that child's imagination. So guess what happens next time they go to the beach? You know, there's this fear of the water. And it can go on till you're even older. And, and as a child, the water may have been up to here, but as an adult, you know, it's only up to here. 
and yet you're afraid of the water. And that isn't a rational thought, that's an emotional belief. And somehow we need to correct that. And that's called emotional relearning. And we'll talk a lot about that in this class. And it's an exciting concept. It's an exciting concept. Well, why do we need to do that? Because there's this continuous stress going on from the emotional learnings that we had. Now, you, can you imagine if that little child you know, they were going to go to the beach every week, <laughs> how nervous they would be. You know, take a, a phobia, right? You can have a phobia of something. And, and uh, I know I wrestled with a lot of phobias and elevators. Phobia is one of the biggest ones I've had to work with. And, and I remember thinking, oh, I got to go downtown. And I'd start prepping myself early. And, then, and the anticipation and the fear that would come up, that was an emotional learning, you see. And, and so this was a continuous stress. Well, when we have negative thoughts about ourselves, for example, I've, I've wrestled with being a people pleaser. Well, being a people pleaser means that I walk into a room and I think, hmm, what are people going to think about me? Now, it's not so conscious. It's, it's already a body reaction. It's like there's a predator in the room. I'm not even thinking about it. It's in the background, but it's this stress. Am I going to do everything right? Am I going to do something wrong? What are they going to think? All that kind of thing goes on and it causes this continuous stress. <clears throat> well, this continuous avoidable stress uh, leads then to all kinds of issues and we want to escape from it and that's where addictions can come from that's where avoidant behavior can come from and all that happens now we learn even as children about emotions and children don't think in terms of feelings and they don't obviously have a logic going on and they don't have a vocabulary but yet they can think in terms of pleasantness in energy, they react that way. And it was uh, Mark Brackett who came up with that in this book, Feelings of Emotions. He talks about, uh, he did some studies that other people did and, that, and he makes a grid where you have uh, the, the pleasantness on one scale and you have energy on the other. And so you can have, a child can have high energy and low pleasantness Right? And they're high energy and low. That would be like they're enraged, right? They're angry or they're hyper nervous. They're uneasy. And a child knows what that feels like and they make associations. This certain look on that face or this certain circumstance, this certain word caused me distress that was unpleasant. Aggravation, right? High energy. And there can also be, uh, you know, high pleasantness low energy and that would be uh, you know a calm right they're relaxed right carefree that would be the the child after they're fed right <laughs> after they're fed they're pleasant low energy uh, they're ready for a nap right they're feeling good and they know what brings that on and that's trouble with addiction sometimes we try to get out of our things and we know what can affect us in ways that we want even though they're harmful and then there's low pleasantness and high energy, right? Low pleasantness, I don't like this, and yet it's high energy? Well, that would uh, be, <clears throat> you know, disgusted, uh, despair, you know, I'm sullen. And, and so, you know, there can be that kind. And then what, what is high energy and, and high pleasantness? Well, that's, you know, joy, ecstatic, right? Inspired optimism. And children even can associate things with those different levels. And then, of course, as they grow, they start uh, learning that, they reinforce it, and that's where a lot of our emotional relearning comes from. And so we start to put words to it, right? We start to put meaning to it, and trauma can affect us. <clears throat> Traumatic experiences cause us to ask the question, why? And a child, you know, has an immature thought process. You know, in, in a child that, and we'll talk about learning and relearning here in, in lessons to come here, uh, we'll find out that children, when they first start, they think emotionally. The rational part of the brain doesn't even come online. Doesn't even come online till we're around 12 years old. And so they think emotionally. 
and they think socially, which reinforces that emotion, and trauma can cause that. And so there's different kinds of trauma. There's trauma caused by something that should have never happened. And we think in terms of abuse, all right? Uh, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, neglect, uh, right? That uh, neglect would be the second time caused by something that should have happened and did not happen. That would be a form of abandonment or neglect. It should have happened and it didn't happen, you know. And then there, of course, is trauma caused by circumstances, right? Sickness, accidents, deaths in a family, disaster, uh, that kind of thing. Well, what happens, though? What causes the issues is how we interpret these. You know, you wouldn't go to a three-year-old or five-year-old and ask them an opinion on politics. You wouldn't ask them to interpret, you know, why did that happen? Uh, you wouldn't ask them to interpret, uh, you know, what do they believe about someone? Tell me the true meaning of that person. And yet, that child in us is very active today if we haven't corrected some of those thoughts. And don't think children don't hear things or don't see things. They do. My son was uh, on the phone with me talking and, and he was saying uh, about this sickness and, and how, uh, you know, he, he was kind of making a joke, but how serious it was, it could have died. And his son heard that. And his son let out a little screech, and, and Nathan had to cuff the phone and go, son, son, no, I'm not going to die. No, I was talking to Grandpa. I'm fine. <laughs> you know, we forget that children hear things and see things, and they have to make their own meaning out of that. And it's an immature thought process. So, you know, there's a lot of things uh, that we can start thinking about ourselves that aren't good. And, and they it can cause all kinds of problems. And there's ways that we react. You know, a child doesn't know how to react to these things. So sometimes we have an explosive uh, uh, anger. We can have self-destructive behavior as we get older. We can have numbing out. We can have social withdrawal. You know, you can look in the lesson and look at some of these things and ask yourself, you know, am I this way? Have I behaved this way? And here's the secret, a lot of times we underreport. <laughs> and you know what, this isn't a pass-fail class. <laughs> you don't have to worry, the truth will set you free. And if you're feeling some of these things, if you act some of these things, then it's good to know it, because why are we going through this class? Maybe you need to see a counselor that can help you, maybe a pastor, maybe a good friend you can be talking about these things as well. As you're learning, we want to become emotionally mature and that's a process and so I encourage you to find out some of these things you know am I do I have do I have an eating disorder am I having some form of uh, addiction you know there's something I'm doing that I can't seem to stop uh, something that you know I'm trying to escape with all those things will help us to realize uh, what's going on where we can be our own detective and so this is caused by a lot of these beliefs, these traumas that go on and, and not knowing why, having the wrong answer to why. All that affects us. You see, we have maturity needs. And when these needs aren't met, then it causes a, a yearning and it causes self-beliefs. Why am I not getting this? There must be something wrong with me. A child doesn't think in terms of you know, my situation is wrong. They think in terms of what have I done? And, and so there's needs of I feel safe and secure with those that I trust and love. I feel love for me is constant, unconditional and always there. I know that I'm loved, special, valued and unique. I return to peace and joy from painful emotions. I feel like I belong and connected to others. And you can rate yourself on these. It was in the lesson. And you can rate yourself on those. You know, I feel love for who I am without having to perform. I have a bond with my creator and life in his spirit. I have a purpose, meaning, and freedom to use my strengths for good. The, you know, and then I believe that it is never too late to have loving, caring, mature, nurturing relationships. Look at those. Start to ask yourself, what do I believe about these? And it's okay if you're not there. 
But that's where we want to get. We want to get to these places. And, and you know, he who seeks nothing or aims at nothing usually hits it, right? <laughs> we want to aim at something. We want to see change. We want to emotionally relearn. We want to have the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And that's, that's being purposeful. And you know, the, the effects of trauma, they can last throughout our life. Uh, our brain is a vast learning machine. And if a belief is repeatedly believed, it's results in making neuronal pathways very strong. And then a bias sets in. You know, we have a negativity bias, a natural negativity bias that keeps us safe. When you're walking in the woods, it's not the wildflowers are going to hurt you. And, unless you eat them, I guess. But really, it's the bear, right? So you're walking, you're not, you know, you hear a, snap, a twig snap, you know, you look around. Why? Because we have a negativity bias. You know, we want to protect ourselves. But a lot of times it's based on something wrong. If I believe I'm no good and that people don't love me, that I have to perform to be liked, then I'm going to walk around all the time on guard. I'm going, to have, I'm going to really struggle with people to make sure that I'm doing the right thing, hence that people-pleasing I was talking about. And, and so, you know, we have to start realizing, do I have a bias in the way I believe about myself? And, and then the brain starts making predictions based on that and on that bias, and, and we start having a larger capacity to react that way. Now, we want to build a capacity of resilience, being able to bounce back. But a lot of us have, an, have a reaction that's negative, and that's, we have a huge capacity for that. And it can become a state of mind and a trait. And now the good news is we can change. Let me say that again. The good news is we can change. There's hope today. You have a choice. You have a choice. Whether you feel it or not, the good news is we do have a choice and we'll learn how to make those. And so trauma can cause this worry, anxiety, and fear, and it creates a low capacity on resilience. And so we're tempted to escape. But what we want to do, if we had healthy attachments or relationships at home, then, you know, there's faith, hope, and trust. And it gives us a high capacity for resilience. And it can produce then that fruit of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control as we relate to God. You know, God wants to reparent us, if you will. Because here's the good news. We can change. We know today that we can have new attachment styles, uh, new ways of relating to people. My wife helped me with that. Her love and consistency and, and, and unconditional love for me changed my inner beliefs as I related to her. As our mirror neurons started connecting, as I saw the way she looked at me, uh, as I, I experienced her grace and mercy and forgiveness, it started making me re-believe things about myself. And that's the good news. We can change today. We can the trouble is, it's become our normal, and so we don't even see it. And so you need to ask yourself, is this my normal? What am I, what's my normal like? Lord, give me eyes to see, right? Give me eyes to see. And the trouble is, it's been given to us, all these beliefs and things, you, here again, I can't emphasize enough, a lot of it came from the pattern recognition based on a child's uh, belief. Right? We have this pattern recognition. We're looking for things. That people-pleasing thing came from me from my childhood beliefs that I had to behave in order not to be punished. I had to behave in order to be loved. And, and that became a strong, strong part. And, and so we make assumptions and self-beliefs and predictions based on that. You know, I have listed in the lesson, you know, some internal beliefs that we can believe about ourselves. Things like, I am broken. There's something really wrong with me. If people really knew the real me, they would reject me. My sins are worse than other people's. I don't need anybody. You know, nothing works for me. I, have you ever checked some of the beliefs that you have? Did you go through that list and check off some of them? Be honest with yourself. Because, you know, change won't happen 
if we don't start understanding these things. People will always try to control me. Have you ever met a real pessimist? <laughs> they have a lot of uh, assumptions going on. And so I want you to start looking at some of the assumptions and not just the assumptions. Here's the key. Have you made an agreement with them? Have you made an agreement with them? That's what we need to change. The first step is, you know, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to agree with that anymore. Until we make that choice, we're not going to start heading in the other direction. It's not just good enough to feel bad about these things. <laughs> it's not just good enough to say, gee, I can't believe I believe that. We want to say, I want to stop my agreement. There's no reason that I need to continue to believe this. And then we start making the change. But it's hard because a lot of this uh, happened in, when we were in a very suggestible state. Now, I've studied neurofeedback, and I know about the different brain waves, and it was interesting to find out that children have a lower brain wave. Their natural lower brain wave in the theta and alpha and that allows for this suggestibility, and it's strong on imagination. That's why we can have uh, mud pies, right, that are really good, right? Or we have teddy bears that are our best friends. And, and because we have this great imagination. I get along great with children because I have a great imagination. And, and I love entering in that world, if you will. And, and can you imagine a person that was hypnotized? You know, if they're hypnotized and say, hey, listen, every time your cell phone goes off, there's, there's a, you got a 10 second warning that there's a bomb gonna go off. Can you imagine? Their phone goes off and all of a sudden, oh, there's a bomb in the building, quick, run, run. And they wouldn't even know, you know, why they're doing it, but they're doing it. Why? Because they were hypnotized. They were suggestible, right? And that's what happens to us as children. And these strong, strong beliefs, even though they're not always in our awareness, affect us. And part of what we want to do in this class is find out what those are. Find out what they are. Find out what we emotionally believe that creates an emotional reaction in us, and then we want to emotionally relearn the truth. Relearn the truth. You know, Dr. Hendricks, who wrote uh, a book, Dr. Harville H Hendricks, with his wife, Dr. Helen Hunt, wrote a book called Receiving Love. And that was part of my issue. I didn't know how to receive love. And, and he said this, it seems that the past should stay in the past, but the truth is the past is always with us. It's just a question of how it manifests. And, and he says, you know, although we may rebel against this notion, we can shall see that the processes that lead us to self-rejection are an inevitable part of having been born and reared by our caregivers. All of us are guilty of causing self-rejection in our children, and all of us have experienced at the hands of our parents. Even those of us who were fortunate enough to have well-parented, been well-parented, and, ha and to be good persons ourselves are not entirely immune. The question isn't whether self-rejection is a factor in our life, it's how much of a factor it is and how we can recognize and deal with it. And so here's the things that we want to start doing. We want to ask ourselves at the first hint of our body uh, starting to react, that first hint of emotions, we can slow it down. You know, slow it down, right? I love that part. <laughs> you know, slow it down, right? And start to ask yourself, what's going on? What am I feeling? What am I believing? And then we can start asking, what's the truth? And the truth will set us free. Well, part of your homework was to go through the body scan. I hope you've been doing that. Start with your head and your face and just kind of check it out. See if, see if there's any tension going on. See if it's relaxed. And then relax it if it's not. But start to pay attention to your body. You know, do you have tenseness up here? I carried a lot of anxiety and tension in my jaw. And, and there's ways of doing this. But look through that exercise and start uh, doing it, okay? 
And then the spiritual exercise or insight that we had in the chapter, you know, is, is that we have those things. I feel safety and security with those I trust and love. I feel love for me is constant. I put some scriptures in there for you to meditate on. God wants to help you emotionally relearn. He created you and he wants you to be all that he can, you can be. And he wants to come against those lies that have been put into your head. And so look at some of those scriptures. Start to read them. Start, you know, ones that really speak to your heart. Write them down on a three by five card. Put them out there and start to emotionally relearn. Well, we're on a journey, friends. We're on a journey together to discover who we are emotionally and how we can emotionally relearn. So I encourage you to stay with us, invite others, get a group together to watch this. And God bless you and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.